On January 28th of 1981, a young woman in Arizona went missing outside of a convenience store. But what happened to her, and why, would shock an entire town. This is the case of Suzanne Rossetti. Hello, friend, and welcome to High Time Crime. My name's Joel, and on here I specialize in true crime and also rock climbing. This would be a lot easier if I didn't have a fear of heights. But anyways, today we're going over the case of Suzanne Rossetti, a young woman who bought two strangers a six-pack of beer and was repaid in the worst way imaginable. For our story, we're heading to Maricopa County, Arizona. Maricopa County is one of the most well-known counties of Arizona, filled with parks, tourist locations, and the famous city of Phoenix. It has a long storied history going back many years and is an interesting place to live and even to visit. If you ever find yourself here, there's plenty of cool things to do. You could take a trip to the Phoenix City Zoo and become witness to many different forms of animals. You could head over to the Castles and Coasters, an amusement park with thrilling rides and coasters. You could stop by the Butterfly Wonderland, a beautiful interactive rainforest housing thousands of butterflies. You could even go to Hole in the Rock to see a hole in the rock. Cool. But despite how fun all of those things sound, none of them are the reason as to why we're in the area today. Suzanne Maria Rossetti was born on May 3rd in 1954 in Saugus, Massachusetts. Her father, Peter Rossetti, owned his own insurance business while her mother, Louise, was a stay-at-home mom. Suzanne was the youngest member of her family and had one older brother named Peter Jr. and an older sister named Donna. Overall, the family was extremely tight-knit and traditional, and they lived in a three-story colonial home. Suzanne's father, Peter, lived a very active life, and his business thrived. And the Rossetti parents taught their children that if they worked hard and became honest, down-to-earth citizens, good things would happen. Additionally, there was a strong sense of community and trust instilled in the young Rossettis. Suzanne's father, Peter, was a part of various local clubs and networks, and he was also a prominent member of the church. And generally, it appears as if Suzanne's early childhood was as normal and stable as anyone's could get. According to others, Suzanne's personality was that of a humble, hardworking, and focused person. And this perfect combination of characters led to her doing very well in school, both academically and socially. Throughout her time in junior high school to high school, Suzanne was well-liked and popular with plenty of friends. She played sports, did cheerleading, was the vice class president, a member of the student council, and part of the National Honor Society. And after passing high school with flying colors, Suzanne soon began attending college at North Adams State College, which is now known as the Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts. Similar to her experience in high school, she did great here as well. And by the time she graduated in 1976 with a degree in sociology, she had also acquired a taste for the great outdoors, which leads us to our next chapter in the story, Suzanne's move across country. So all in all, up until this point, nothing had really gone terribly wrong in Suzanne's life. Sure, she had gone through a couple of bad breakups, some minor injuries playing sports, and some other minor things like that. But for the most part, in her life, everything had gone as smooth as butter. But what was about to happen in a few short years was going to be a complete and total nightmare. Now, after leaving college, Suzanne had moved around a bit, 
going from Massachusetts to Louisiana to California, all before eventually settling down in Arizona. Here in Arizona, her parents had bought a condominium in Scottsdale, and they allowed her to live in it. Suzanne absolutely loved the West. The beautiful rock formations, the weather, the mountains, everything. Before long, she acquired a wonderful group of friends and started doing things like rock climbing and running marathons. And then, after having a job as a waitress for a few years, in 1979, she ultimately landed a job at a pharmaceutical company, which for her was really sort of a big deal because it was really like her first big-time job. Meanwhile, back in Massachusetts, though, her father's health had started to take a turn for the worse. Evidently, his time working on a shipyard earlier in life led to various medical complications, including both lung and heart issues. All Suzanne really could do about it, though, was check in on him every now and again over the phone. And eventually, after a triple bypass surgery, her father's health stabilized. But it still took a big toll on Suzanne mentally. As it would anybody. But even so, she remained the energetic, positive person she always had been. And within only a year of being at the pharmaceutical company job, she got promoted. And then, less than a year after that, she was due for another promotion, where she would move back to the East Coast and this time live in New York, something that her parents and family members were very proud of. However, none of that was ever going to happen because in just a few short months, Suzanne Rossetti was about to wind up missing. In the first week of January 1981, Suzanne Rossetti's parents, Peter and Louise, had flown in from Massachusetts to Arizona for their yearly winter vacation. But now, almost a month later, it was January 28th, and the two of them were scheduled for a flight back home in the early hours of the next morning. So the plan was for Suzanne to pick them up from a hotel called the Roadway Inn, take them to an airport a little after 11 p.m., and then see them off. However, for whatever reason, Suzanne just wasn't showing up which certainly wasn't like her because she was very responsible and always arrived on time. But as the hours passed, Peter and Louise, who were still waiting inside the inn for their daughter to arrive, got the feeling that something must have gone terribly wrong. Shortly after midnight, they decided to contact the police, and over the phone, Peter Rossetti explained the situation. But because it had only been a little over an hour, the police didn't really take him seriously. They did inform him that no car accidents had been reported, but when he requested to file a missing persons report, he wasn't able to do so because 24 hours hadn't passed yet. Police did inform Peter that no car accidents had been reported, so that was ruled out for that reason. But after that first phone call, he then called a bunch of hospitals to see if she checked in there, but still, nothing. Next, he called the police again for the second time, and once again, nothing. By that point, both Peter and Louise had become increasingly anxious and irritated. Ultimately, Peter wound up calling all the police stations around Phoenix and Scottsdale several times, and every time, he came up short. For the Scottsdale police, he even specifically requested for an officer to go check on the condominiums Suzanne was living in. But they said they didn't take those type of requests. Are you kidding me? Anyway, around 2.30 a.m., while Peter and Louise were still waiting at the roadway inn for their daughter, Louise went outside to check the cars that were passing by. Soon, she spotted a car passing by that was the exact make and model of Suzanne's, a light-colored Ford Pinto. 
But the only problem was that the occupants weren't Suzanne, but two scraggly looking men. Right away, Louise yelled inside to Peter, that looks like Suzanne's car. But once it had passed, she quickly changed her mind. Not long after that, Peter and Louise took a taxi to the airport to see if Suzanne might have driven there instead. But when they didn't see her at the airport either, they then retraced their daughter's steps all over town going from one place to the next. Before long, they wound up at the condominium Suzanne lived at, and it was there that things became far more worrisome. The inside of Suzanne's condo looked like it had been ransacked. Random things were strewn across the floor. Lights were on that weren't on before. And some strange items were on the carpet, including a burnt piece of aluminum foil and a small strip of... Right away, Peter called all the different police stations again, but the only one that finally agreed to send an officer was the Scottsdale police. But even he wouldn't arrive until the next shift in an hour or so. On top of that, the rest of the police stations gave Peter a bunch of excuses about jurisdiction and the minimal amount of time that had elapsed. So, still fed up about the authorities' unwillingness to cooperate, Peter and Louise found Suzanne's phone book and started calling all of her friends. None of Suzanne's friends could really provide any answers about her whereabouts, but one guy, a guy named Pug, did agree to help search for her. So after that, Pug drove to Suzanne's condominium, and after speaking with Peter and Louise for a bit, he and Peter rode up to the police station in order for Peter to confront the police in person. Once they got there, Peter yelled at the officer for ignoring many of his phone calls and his lack of action, and in return, the officer threatened to have Peter arrested for disorderly conduct. But Peter had made enough of a ruckus that a detective came out to speak to him and ultimately agreed to go investigate Suzanne's place. And so after the detective arrived at the condo and did a bit of searching, he asked Pug, Peter, and Louise about what type of person Suzanne was and just general information. Additionally, he took a bunch of photos of the ransacked condo and although he still couldn't order a missing persons investigation, he was able to report Suzanne's car as stolen. So at the very least, there was finally one form of police investigation by then. But once the first 24 hours passed, the rest of the week was as much of a nightmare as the night before. Days passed without any evidence of Suzanne, and so Peter and Louise started to become quite desperate. Soon, Louise enlisted the help of a psychic who previously had a lot of experience working with law enforcement. The psychic's name was Joan, and what Joan told Louise was something that was a bit hard to swallow. She said that Suzanne had been by two men, and that it all happened near a bunch of mountains. Now, one piece of information that Joan claims she withheld from Louise, however, was the tragic fate of her daughter, which is something we'll unfortunately get to soon enough. But because of Suzanne's tight-knit family and group of friends, there was a heck of an effort to find her. Peter, Louise, Pug, and countless others searched everywhere they could possibly think of. Meanwhile, Suzanne's father, Peter, was forced to return home to Massachusetts and continue his own efforts there. Evidently, the search was taking a toll on his health, and he even wound up hospitalized while he was in Arizona. But even so, he still continued calling in and criticizing the various local police departments for their lack of action from home. But with this leadership vacuum that needed to be filled, it was only a matter of time before one of Suzanne's friends took the reins. And as it turns out, there was a perfect man for the job. So as we mentioned earlier, one of Suzanne's favorite pastimes that she picked up while living in Arizona was rock climbing. 
Naturally, though, she didn't do this alone. She did it with a group of friends. And one of these rock-climbing friends was an FBI agent by the name of Gary Reed. About a day after Suzanne's disappearance, Gary had returned home from work when his wife informed him about Suzanne's disappearance. Despite being shocked to hear this news, he got to work helping to look for her right away. Soon, Gary interviewed all of Suzanne's neighbors and began keeping in frequent contact with the authorities. And because of his status as an FBI agent, he essentially became the leading authority outside of the official investigation. And so whenever any of Suzanne's family or friends wanted an update, they just asked Gary about it. Meanwhile, the frenzied search continued, with Suzanne's friends and family putting flyers everywhere and searching every nook and cranny in Arizona. Additionally, the disappearance of Suzanne Rossetti was now being broadcast on the nightly news. But before long, Gary received a phone call from the Phoenix police informing him about a major breakthrough in the case. They said that they had found Suzanne's car at the Phoenix City Zoo in Papago Park. They also told him that he was welcome to come see the car, but not actually investigate because the FBI hadn't opened a case yet. But when police searched Suzanne's Pinto, they discovered the first big clue of the entire investigation. It was a paper laundry receipt with the name Chess Gillies at the bottom. Right away, the authorities asked themselves, who was this Chess Gillies? And how did he have any connection to Suzanne? But on top of that, Gary also found some other details unsettling, including the condition of a bra that they uncovered and a high-heeled shoe inserted into a leg. Overall, the car was inoperable and in rough condition, but the receipt gave them something to work with. Soon, police called the owners of the laundry business that the receipt came from. It was a place called Campus Cleaners, and the person they called was a girl named Sarah. Sarah told police over the phone that two men had come into the store driving a light-colored Pinto a few days before. One was six foot, about 200 pounds. The other was around 5'10", 180 pounds. The one named Chess worked at a horse riding stable, and he had dropped off two pair of pants for alteration and was supposed to pick them up a few days later. As for what the name of the riding stable was, Sarah couldn't recall, but she said that it started with a W. So upon learning this, Police did a stakeout of campus cleaners and waited to see if this Chess would come and pick up his pants. However, when the time came for Chess to pick them up, there was no sign of him whatsoever. As they were waiting, though, Gary and others did find two ripped up towels in the dumpsters behind the store. And according to Sarah, the two men that came in were the ones that had dumped the towels back there. Meanwhile, Gary had a strong suspicion that these were likely used to tie up Suzanne. But once the stakeout failed and Chess never showed up, police began looking into nearby horse stables. One of the closest ones was a place called Weldon. And so from the campus cleaner's phone, one of the police officers called Weldon and asked to speak to Chess Gillies. The person on the other line didn't know any Chess Gillies that worked there, but he did know a man named Jess Gillies, so he handed the phone over to him. Then the police officer, acting as if he was an employee at the cleaners, told Jess his pants were ready to be picked up. Jess said he forgot about the pants and asked if he could pick them up the following day, to which the officer agreed. But of course, that would never end up happening, because now that the police knew about Jess Gilly's whereabouts, it was time to place him under arrest. And while they couldn't do it for murder quite yet, they did have enough evidence that he was one of the ones responsible for stealing Suzanne's car. 
So shortly after the phone call, police drove up to the Weldon horse riding stable in order to arrest Jess Gillies. Something that, as it turned out, would be a lot easier said than done. For several hours, they chased him in the mountains while he was on horseback before ultimately catching him. And even when police were finally able to interview this Jess Gillies, he still wouldn't give up. But before we explain what he told police, let's give you a little info into who exactly this man was. So putting it mildly, Jess, aka Jesse James Gillies, was a career criminal with a shady background. As a child, his mother frequently made it clear that she didn't love him, and overall his relationship with his family was one of overt hostility. Growing up, Jess could never stay out of trouble, and by age 12, he had already stolen a car. And despite now being only 20 years old, he had been in and out of juvie and jail multiple times. So needless to say, this was one messed up dude. But around the time that he was caught by the police for stealing Suzanne's car, he had been released from prison just a couple months prior. Evidently, Jess was supposed to be changing himself for the better with this new job at the horse riding stable, but I guess you can see exactly how well that worked out. Anyway, during his interview with police for stealing Suzanne's car, Jess was told by police not only was he a suspect for Grand Theft Auto, but that he and another man were suspected of committing Jess told police that he had no knowledge of any and then blamed the entire ordeal on the other man who was with him the night of Suzanne's disappearance, Mike Richardson. Jess claimed that Mike Richardson was the one who had stolen the car and presumably Suzanne. But police didn't buy Jess's story, mostly because for the past 24 hours, he had been practically bragging about committing to anyone who would listen. So instead, they locked him up for the time being on charges of homicide and, and before being booked, Jess's last question to the officer doing the booking was, how do they put you to... To which the officer replied, and Jess responded, all that just for killing that... Meanwhile, police went in search of this Mike Richardson guy. Now at first, they didn't really have a considerable amount of info to go off of, but they did have two pieces of evidence given to them by Jess that turned out to be enough. One, that Mike Richardson was an escaped convict from Michigan, and two, there was a man named Frank who might have had knowledge about Mike's whereabouts. So first, police contacted Suzanne's FBI friend, Gary, and updated him on the newly acquired information. And once Gary was filled in, he quickly agreed to call up Michigan state officials in order to dig up profiles on all convicts, matching the physical description of Mike Richardson. Next, police called this individual named Frank. Now, evidently, Frank was the owner of a different horse stable that Mike had some association with. And fortunately, he knew exactly where Mike was. A little place known as the Contiki Hotel. On top of that, Frank was even able to give the police the exact room number that Mike was staying in. So within a matter of hours, the police swarmed the hotel and caught Mike Richardson. But as it turns out, his name wasn't really Mike Richardson. It was actually Michael David Logan. And yes, he was an escaped convict from Michigan. But boy, was he a lot worse than that. In fact, Michael was all the worst things that a person could possibly be. Similar to Jess Gillies, the other man under arrest, Michael had lived most of his life as a career criminal. He had a lengthy list of convictions under his belt. And to all that associated with him, Michael was best known as being openly and a heavy drinker. Additionally, he was calculating and obsessed with money. 
But after escaping from jail in Michigan, he had relocated to Arizona and started working at Weldon Riding Stables. And it was here that Michael was introduced to Jess Gillies. Together, the two formed a friendship that would turn out to be a ticking time. When Michael was caught in the hotel and then interviewed by police, he played dumb for a little while until ultimately confessing. But with that in mind, here's what authorities believe to be exactly what happened the night of Suzanne's disappearance. It's a combination of Michael's testimony and all the facts discovered in the case. And just a warning, it's pretty tough to listen to. So as we discussed earlier, on the night of January 29th of 1981, Suzanne Rossetti was supposed to pick her parents up from the roadway inn in order to take them to the airport. A little before that, though, she had gone to a theater with a few friends to see a dance performance. And after the dance performance was over, she then went to a nearby restaurant and called her father, Peter. Here was where Suzanne and her parents made arrangements for her to pick them up at the roadway inn. And on the other end of the line, Peter cautioned his daughter about the area that they were visiting. He said that it was dangerous and just generally not a good part of town. After that, the phone call ended and Suzanne left the restaurant and headed for the inn. However, on the way, she decided to stop at a U-Totem convenience store in order to get a pack of chewing gum. So she pulled up, parked outside, and then went in the store to buy some gum. Now by this point, she still had a decent amount of time to waste, so she took her time. Meanwhile, sitting on the curb outside of the store were two scraggly looking men dressed in cowboy hats and boots. The two men, Jess Gillies and Michael Logan, were initially planning to rob the convenience store for some quick cash. But now that they saw this girl walk in, they wondered how much money she may have on her. But when Suzanne finally exited the convenience store, fate was going to introduce the three of them regardless. After walking over to her car and trying to open it, Suzanne suddenly realized that she had locked her keys inside the car. Quickly, she then strutted back into the convenience store and asked the cashier for some help. But he declined her request saying, I'm sorry, lady, but I can't leave my register. After that, Suzanne went outside and continued looking for a way to get into her car. Before long, the two dirty looking men approached her and asked if she needed some help. Naturally, Suzanne agreed. And within no time, they got the car open for her. In return for their kindness, Suzanne then asked if there was anything that she could do for them. They said that she could buy them a six pack of beer to which Suzanne happily agreed. And so she went into the store and bought the beer and when she came out, she gave it to them. However, when she went to get into her car, the two men requested another favor. They wanted her to drop them off at the Weldon Ranch up the street where they worked at. Now, by this point, Suzanne was starting to get a sense that something wasn't right, but even so, the two men had basically f***ed themselves inside of the car. So really, she had no other option than to begin driving them to their destination. Also, just keep in mind that these men were about a foot taller than her and a lot stronger. So once she had driven them up to the ranch and parked her car momentarily, Jess Gillies, the de facto leader of the two criminals, struck Suzanne on the side of the head. After that, Jess pushed her out of the car and began her on the ground. Meanwhile, Michael, who was still in the car and elsewhere looking for anything of value. Once Jess was finished with Suzanne, he asked Michael if he wanted to take advantage of her himself. However, Michael declined. Next, the two of them told Suzanne to put her clothes back on tied up her hands with two towels they found in the car, and forced her into the back seat of the vehicle. They then covered her body and face with a blanket and told her not to make a sound or else. 
After that, they went for a bit of a joyride around town. And using the money they stole from Suzanne, they bought more beer. But at a certain point, the money and beer just wasn't enough. They wanted more. Soon, the two criminals forced Suzanne to give up the address to her home. Then, while on the way there, they passed the roadway in. As Suzanne's mother, Luis, was waiting outside, and as it turns out, Luis did spot Suzanne's car when she was out there looking. She apparently also spotted what looked like a small child in the back of the car, but in reality, that was actually Suzanne. Nevertheless, after driving up to Suzanne's condo, the two criminals ransacked the place, took advantage of Suzanne once more in her bed, and smoked some leaving the burnt aluminum foil and a bit of on the carpet. Additionally, they found Suzanne's ATM card, which would end up being something they used for several days. But following their trip to her condo, Jess and Michael drove to the ATM to withdraw money from the card. And although Suzanne informed them that there was over $4,000 in her account, because of the withdrawal limit, they were only able to take out $250. But by this point, the time was now a little past two in the morning. And as the potential consequences for their actions started to settle in, Jess and Michael needed to come up with a plan for what to do with Suzanne. Under no circumstances would they ever have considered letting her go, because that would mean going back to jail for a very long time. So in their warped, demented minds... They figured the only thing they could do was murder her. But where would they do it, and how? Quickly, they thought of heading up to an area known as the Superstition Mountains and finishing her off there. Now, the Superstition Mountains is a famous mountain range that, according to old Apache legends, was a site of a hole that led straight to hell. The area is generally dry and rugged and surrounded by cacti. But when Jess, Michael, and their hostage, Suzanne, pulled up to the area, it was dark and cold, and the air was even somewhat wet. Once they got there, they drove up to a high scenic part called Fish Creek Hill. This particular part is known for being a bit unsettling to drive through because of its elevation and how close it is to the side of a cliff. After parking, though, they pulled Suzanne out of the car and stood her up. And by then, she was tired, bruised, covered in dirt, and in a considerable amount of pain. Right away, she said to her captors, I guess you're going to kill me now. To which neither of them responded. Then Jess proceeded to take advantage of Suzanne again. And after he was finished, so did Michael. Afterwards, Jess stood Suzanne up, grabbed her arm, and said, we're going for a hike. To which she responded, I'm not going anywhere with you. Next, Jess and Michael walked Suzanne several miles up the road and found a narrow opening in the guardrails. Looking down from the side of the cliff, they thought the dark abyss stretched indefinitely. So it was here that they decided to finish Suzanne off. They walked her up next to the side of the cliff, and as she repeatedly screamed, No, no, no they pushed her. However, the outcome wasn't exactly what they planned. Despite her falling down the cliff nearly 40 feet and landing on a rock, Suzanne was somehow still alive. From the top of the cliff, Jess and Michael could hear her and groaning, and right away, they started debating on what they should do. Eventually, they grabbed a flashlight from the car and agreed to climb down to where she was at. While they were standing above her, they once again brainstormed about what to do with her. But while they were brainstorming, Suzanne attempted to sit up from the rock. So Michael then pushed her back down, and with her face now bleeding terribly, she said, Let's go home and let me cook you a meal. Meanwhile, the two men began arguing over who was going to be the one to kill her. Suzanne said to them, Leave me alone. I'm going to die anyway. To which Jess replied, You're right, you are. 
And that was the last exchange that Suzanne had with another human being. Shortly after that, Jess grabbed a large rock and proceeded to take her life. And once Suzanne finally appeared to be dead, the two criminals covered her face and body up using a bunch of rocks. And that was the tragic end of a beautiful person's life for absolutely no reason at all. The following several days, Jess and Michael used Suzanne's credit card and car, bought a bunch of drinks, and they partied. And in the end, they wound up leaving the car near the Phoenix City Zoo. But once the evil duo was finally caught and put on trial, the sentencing goes as follows. Jesse James Gillies was given the death penalty, while Michael David Logan was sentenced to life behind bars in exchange for showing police where Suzanne's body was. And in 2021, he wound up dying in prison. As for what happened to Suzanne's parents, well, obviously, they were devastated about what occurred to their daughter, but they were able to sue the police department for the way they treated Suzanne's case in the first few days. And Louise even wound up living to see Jess Gillies, something that should have happened sooner but took place in 1999. Meanwhile, Peter lived for another 11 years to the age of 75, which, considering his medical conditions, and the amount of stress he went through with his daughter's death is pretty long. So yeah, this case was a pretty hard one to get through. Suzanne Rossetti was a promising young woman who had everything going for her. Good friends, a high-paying job, and a bright future. But in the end, all of that was taken from her by two sources of pure evil. Even so, the resiliency and braveness that Suzanne showed at the end of her life was inspiring. And so there's always that to look back on. Also, I just wanted to add the fact that in 1981, the Suzanne Maria Rossetti Memorial Juried Art Contest was started, and it's been going strong ever since with the 41st annual contest that happened in March of 2023. I think it's a nice way to honor Suzanne and I'm glad to see it still going. But anyways, thank you for watching this episode of High Time Crime. If true crime is your thing, then please subscribe and hit the like button because that's all we do. I also have a second account with my brother named Hora Flying where we tell stories about everything paranormal. This includes true crime, mysteries, and things that are just downright spooky. I'd greatly appreciate if you subscribed to that too. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care, friend.